It is nearly midnight and my father is dying. The physicians continue to scurry around him, grinding up herbs as pestles or chanting over their poultices. But the lavender scented smoke of the fire can't mask the odour of this decaying flesh. Candlelight can't conceal the laboured breath, the claw like fingers clutching convulsively at the bedclothes. He pushes the nearest doctor away, irritable, and beckons me closer. The doctors mutter about infection. Still, I obey. As I balance on the edge of the massive oak framed bed, my red silk skirts are like a spill of blood in the dimness. I lean in, holding tight to one of his hands. This. He gestures to the weeping sores on his chest and shoulders. A mistake. I stayed too long in the contagion. His speech is thickened as if his tongue is swollen. I'm sorry, Adarin. I understand him. The sickness that has ravaged one of our port towns in the last month has led to quarantine and death. My father, to help his people or in the cause of science, or both, stayed with the afflicted, hoping to discover a cure. He has gambled his life in pursuit of knowledge before, but this time he lost. And now, now he wants absolution. I try to tell him that all will be well, that the doctors might still find a way to save him, but the lie catches in my throat. Instead, I stare into his clouded eyes and murmur, I know, it's late, Father, you should rest. But he shakes his head and grits his teeth, blinking, trying to focus. I want you to stay here. Once I'm gone, stay in the castle. His words are not new. I've been confined within our castle on the peninsula upon which he stands for years. So many years that I long ago stopped asking when I would be allowed to leave. I have learned that it's possible to stand in the open air with the wind on my face and still suffocate. But it is possible to command others and still be a prisoner. You must stay. He breaks off in a paroxysm of coughing. A servant darts in and wipes the blood and spit it from his chin. Stay here where it's safe. Promise me. Perhaps this sickness is finally claiming his mind. If I never leave, I cannot do what will be required of me. And I cannot believe my father truly expects me to become my own jailer, trapped behind these walls for an oath of my own making. But I am wrong, apparently. He grips my upper arm tightly, pulling himself up, the pressure of his fingers still painful despite his loss of strength. Promise me, Adarin. You know I love you. All I want is, he gasps in pain, to protect you. I know you love me, father. And I love him too. But I make no promise. I won't lie to him now. Mercifully, he does not notice my omission. He sinks back into the mattress, eyelids flushing as the clock begins playing the chimes that lead to the hour. Good. You'll understand eventually, I hope. And finally, finally, your mother. The words fade into silence. Father, what about her? Please, if there's anything you haven't told me, anything. My voice seems to be coming from a long way away. I shake his shoulder. Father. The doctors cluster around and I move gently to one side as they check pulse and breathing and heartbeat. And then someone is closing his eyes and drawing the sheet up over his face. The clock strikes the hour. Your grace. For a moment I don't understand. I think, my father is dead. He can't answer you. But the servant repeats the your grace. And then I realise he is addressing me. I am no longer a 17 year old girl who can spend her time exactly as she wishes. I'm no longer merely Lady Adderan. I am her grace, protector of the dominion of Atratus, sole mistress of Merle Castle and all the lands that belong to it. Somehow, in the space between the end of one day and the start of the next, everything has changed. Okay, so I'm going to read you a little extract from Alex in Wonderland, um, and this is taken from the bit where Alex has got his job at Wonderland now, and his first task is to hand out flyers advertising the amusement arcade as he walks around town, dressed as Wonderland's mascot, which unfortunately uh, for Alex is a pink flamingo. So he's got um, kind of pink tights on, a fluffy pink middle, uh, pink kind of diving flippers on his feet, and is holding a sort of flamingo head in one hand while handing out flyers with the other. 
Not a great look, but he's giving it his best shot. Then the universe must have remembered that I hadn't had any bad luck for half an hour and I was well overdue. And so, right on cue, there's this huge roar of fierce barking and I turned to see approximately 30 kilograms of angry savage muscle and teeth on four legs hurtling towards me with terminal velocity. An oldish man with a kind face, presumably the dog's owner, shouted from some distance away, it's okay, he hates flightless birds. Leaving aside the fact a flamingo is not a flightless bird, unless he also mistook me for an ostrich, of course, there was no part of this situation which was remotely okay. In what world is a massive feral beast with dripping fangs running towards a living creature it openly hates ever going to be okay? Mate, I would run, a worried looking bloke said to me. Don't run, the owner shouted, now puffing and tottering towards me as well, because of course this dog's owner wouldn't be fit enough to actually sprint up to his dog and call him off. You'll be fine if you stay still. The violent barking suggested otherwise, and I know it sounds unlikely when I say this dog had red eyes, but it, I think it seriously did have, and this is not normal. Mate, run, another passerby implored me. All I could see, bolting towards me, was teeth. Dear Christ, some woman said. That kid's gonna get maimed, another voice. Run, a man screamed. I ran, or rather, I rapidly flip-flopped along the promenade. I didn't dare look back, but the barking was getting louder, as was the rapid thud of heavy paws galloping on tarmac. I ran straight past the fiberglass lemon, hoping maybe that Lemon Boy wouldn't recognise me, although that was the least of my worries right then, as I had visions of this thing taking a huge chunk out of one of my legs. It was then I had an idea. Dogs can't do stairs. So I struggled down the steps that led onto the beach. Except of course dogs can do stairs and the brooded thug of a dog was hurtling down them right after me. I squealed, now left with no option but to head directly for the sea because in my panicked brain, dogs can't swim. Although of course they totally can. I ploughed through a huge sandcastle town that some father and daughter were building, looking over my shoulder seconds later to see the dog also charge through, leaving a plume of sand and debris in its wake like Godzilla tearing through New York. I ran forwards, splashing through the waves, hoping to hell the owner would arrive any second to call his stupid animal off, and then... And then there's nothing underneath my feet but water. And I'm plunging down. I forgot that the water gets deep quickly on this beach. One minute it's fine, and the next there's this, this ledge you basically fall off. And I don't know why it didn't occur to me like 20 seconds ago, but I can't swim. So now I'm, a very different panic floods my body as I flail my arms about and there's water in my mouth and I'm, I'm swallowing it and help, I gasped. And it's stinging my eyes and there's, there's thick mucus dripping out of my nose and down the back of my throat and I can't actually see and I can't breathe. I'm just gulping in salt water. And I bob up with the swell of the current and then this huge wave towering over me crashes down on my head and... And that is where we will leave poor Alex. Um, about to drown by the looks of it while being pursued by an angry dog. Does he escape? Well, hopefully if you've read the book, you'll know. Uh, there we go, the voice track from uh, Alex in Wonderland there. I hope you enjoyed it. I'd like to read you an extract from Viper. I'm going to read you a short amount from the end of chapter one. I was six when I saw my first execution. Well, the first one I remember anyway. Everybody had congregated at the ship's helm. The atmosphere so menacing that despite my youth, I sensed something was terribly wrong. The man had been dragged up from the brig where he'd clearly been for some time. He was in a wretched state, emaciated, beaten, filthy. The wind carried his stench to where I stood and made me gag. The captain had towered over the cowering man and told us all of his betrayal, how he'd failed to carry out an assignment entrusted to him. I hadn't really understood what was happening until the captain grabbed him by the hair and slashed his throat. Always the throat. He likes a savage death, my father. The man had dropped to his knees before falling forward, blood bubbling from the wound to surround his body with a strange and deathly halo. 
I didn't see a captain reprimanding a disobedient crew member. I saw my father committing the murder of an unarmed man, and I'd cried. It was the wrong reaction. My father was furious with me, both for disappointing and humiliating him. Punishments had followed, the worst of which was having to clean the congealed mess left behind once the corpse had been flung into the deep waters. Who knew a dress could absorb so much of a man? Perhaps that is why even now the memory lingers. Standing on the same part of the deck, I can identify the exact place where the evidence once lay soaking into the fabric of our ship, though there is nothing visible to the eye. I was made to scour and scrub until every trace of the crimson stain was gone, but that dress always bore the scar. Yet somehow the metallic smell of iron still reaches my nose, and I move slightly further away, wanting to leave the past where it belongs. After all, I have seen many men die since that day. Too many. I look down at the freezing black waters, the grave of countless sailors, and wonder why anyone would prefer the unsettling waves to the solidity of the ground. My father's ship, the Maiden's Revenge, cuts through the water with ease, a silent predator feared by all in the Eastern Isles. She's untroubled by these treacherous seas, but I've seen what happens to those on lesser ships when caught in storms, and know the ocean to be as deadly as any assassin. Lurking in its depths is an army of its own, vicious killers hidden in the dark, waiting to strike at any opportunity. Merbeasts will hunt anything for prey, including humans, and more than one ship has been devoured by giant serpent sharks. One of my earliest memories is of spiralling through the sea, my limbs tangling with the water as it filled my lungs, the weight of it, the unbearable heavy darkness. I don't remember how I fell in or who fished me out, but I do know the fear as if it were yesterday. My dreams remind me if I try to forget. If the maiden is my prison, then it is the ocean who is my jailer. For any snake to feel this way is unthinkable, but for me, daughter of the viper, to be afraid of the water, it is my greatest shame and my biggest failure. I have, after all, been born for this purpose, whether I like it or not. Everyone in Little Kilton knew where they lived. Their home was like the town's own haunted house. People's footsteps quickened as they walked by, and their words strangled and died in their throats. Shrieking children would gather on their walk home from school, daring one another to run up and touch the front gate. But it wasn't haunted by ghosts, just three sad people trying to live their lives as before. A house not haunted by flickering lights or spectral falling chairs, but by dark spray-painted letters of scum family and stone-shattered windows. Pip had always wondered why they didn't move. Not that they had to, they hadn't done anything wrong, but she didn't know how they lived like that. Pip knew a great many things. She knew that Hippopotamonstrosequidalia phobia was the technical term for the fear of long words. She knew that babies were born without kneecaps. She knew verbatim the best quotes from Plato and Cato and that there were more than 4,000 types of potato. But she didn't know how the Sings found the strength to stay here, here in Kilton, under the weight of so many widened eyes, of the comments whispered just loud enough to be heard, of neighbourly small talk never stretching into long talk anymore. So yeah, so if you've enjoyed reading that, then pick that up, and uh, thanks so much for reading. I'm going to read an extract from Dead Popular. I'm going to read halfway through chapter one, and we join uh, the three girls, that's Kate and her friends, Maribel and Lo, and they're talking about the old house mistress who's, um, who they call the Webster or Wibs. Um, she's been sacked for drinking. And they're very happy to be back at school, and they're looking forward to being on the top floor of this amazing boarding house that's called Pankhurst. 
We took a moment to reminisce about some of Wibbs's finer moments, such as the time she dropped in grades last, packed her Sachiba's ward in assembly. And when she sat down too heavily in a chair in the junior common room and it collapsed, taking several of us to heave her out of its frame. The time she went shopping and left her new underwear in the junior common room, it had been fascinatingly enormous and surprisingly frilly, and she'd taken it well when she discovered it dangling from the top corner of her oil painting in the dining hall. So, mini announcement said Lo when there was a pause. I have to work hard this year. Less time wasting at the beach for me. Time at the beach is never wasted, said Marabel. Sea air is good for your skin. Fact. She patted her cheek. Oh, there'll be a record number of applications for the Sixth Form Scholarship, said Lo. Since when did this start being a school parents fought to get their kids into, said Marabel. I thought the mission statement was to be good at the arts, but a little bit crap on the academic side. Oh, it probably got bigged up in a newspaper supplement, I said. And that prompted Mirabel to tell us about an article she read about a cafe in Spain where they simulated earthquakes. She started searching on her phone for it. I closed my eyes. You could always hear the scene packed first, so long as a window was open. It was good to be back. It feels weird being here again, don't you think? asked Lo, half reading my mind. A bit, I said. I was used to switching between places, having had lots of practice. I'd bounce between various schools, Dubai where my parents live, whichever Mediterranean spot they chose to rent over the summer to get away from the desert heat, and Elsie Grand's little house crammed with broken furniture and things lying around waiting to be recycled. Feels the same as ever, said Maribel. She yawned and stretched, and I tickled her armpit. She shrieked and tried to lift my arm to retaliate. The bell rang, we flopped down onto the bed and lay there with Lowe. My stomach's rumbling, said Maribel. Do you think squirrels made any of those low-baked date and cranberry brownies today? Or proper brownies, said Lo with actual chocolate in, or her mini cupcakes with exploded blueberries. It wasn't cool to go down immediately after the bell rang, even if we knew in this case it meant tea and cake in the junior common room. We waited a while before rolling off the bed, checking our faces on our phones, and strolling down the three sets of stairs. Maribel was first, and I bumped into her at the bottom because she'd stopped abruptly. I saw a woman ahead of us with dark blonde hair and a blunt bob, standing with her thin arms crossed. She was maybe early 20s, pale skin with no makeup and dressed in a three-quarter sleeved stiff white shirt tucked into tailored navy trousers. In the context of Mount Norton staff she was relatively attractive but that really wasn't saying much. I knew she must be Miss Calding. The three of us spread out into a line. Girls, she said as she approached us, her voice matching the crispness of that shirt. Lateness won't be tolerated. You are to come downstairs immediately after the bell goes. She looked at my skirt, many inches above the limit. Own clothes must conform to regulations. And then she thrust her hand forward for me to shake and said, Kate Jordan Ferreira, we haven't met yet. Your house prefect, I gather. I'm sure we'll get to know each other well. Her handshake was cold and firm, and her smile wasn't reflected in her eyes. I wondered if she knew what a big deal it was being house prefect. I would be asked to contribute my views on anything to do with Hankhurst. I would be giving speeches throughout the year, Sitting in on interviews with potential new girls, and I had the power to give behaviour points to new girls. And I could skip meal cues and reserve whichever table I wanted in the dining hall. I had a suspicion that life at Pankhurst was about to change, and not for the better. Hi there, I'm going to read you a little bit from The Black Flamingo by Dean Asser. Uh, the scene I'm going to actually read to you is about the main character, Michael, who's quite young in this scene and his mum has just had um, a baby, a little sister. And he's had friends at school asking about the parenting situation of how Anna came about and who the parents were. So I'm just going to read you this little bit. Anna has a different dad, but we have the same surname. Mum decided, and Trevor didn't argue. In the dining hall at school, I explained to Callum, Trevor is Anna's dad, but not mine. Callum asks, if you have different dads, isn't she your half-sister? When I get home, I ask, Mummy, aren't we only half? Don't let anyone tell you that you are half anything. You and Anna are simply brother and sister. Don't let anyone tell you that she's your half-sister. Don't let anyone tell you that you are half black and half white, half Cypriot and half Jamaican. You are a full human being. It's never as simple as being half and half. 
You were born in Britain, you need to make space for what British means. What it means to you to be British, Cypriot and Jamaican too, but it's only for you to decide. The main reason we've kind of read this part to you is because we want to show you that every person, there shouldn't be any division. As a whole, we were kind of made up of so many different fractions that we should be seen as just one person and it's up to you to decide what identity you take. So I would like to read you a section from Blood Moon. Um, I'm going to start um, in the morning after Frankie, the main character, has um, been texting with Benjamin, who's her crush, and um, she's also having a fight with her best friend Harriet, who lives next door to her. Thursday. The fundamentals of physics. Harriet steps out of her front door at the exact same moment as me, and I imagine on another day telling her about Benjamin and what we did, and the pictures we swap late at night in bed, but instead she raises her middle finger at me and says, bitch. Takes one to no one, I say, and turn the other way. She's the one who took a photo of me in the school shower. Talk about bitchy. I don't need her anyway. She said I'm nothing to her. Well, she can be nothing to me. I walk to school, the wind in my hair, the morning sun glistening on the dew. I feel hashtag no filter fit, I'm textbook. I've totally got it. On his street, Benjamin is waiting for me, leaning against the brick wall outside his house. He stands and crosses to meet me. Good morning, I say. Nice to see you. Hey, you, he replies, smiling and walking beside me. Sleep okay? I did, I say. You? Well, he says, off eat, in sync. I had this weird dream that you and me were in space. Like astronauts, I say, glancing at him sideways. Actually, we weren't exactly in space. We were sort of swimming around like there was no gravity. With spacesuits on. Nope. So we were dead. Benjamin laughs. We were sort of in a drawing, he hesitates. Like your curtains? I laugh, nudging him. You dreamed about my curtains. Well, he says. They are totally cosmic. You dreamed about my curtains, I crow, loving the feeling of his th my things making it into his dreams. Did you dream about me, Benjamin asks. And I wish I could lie, but I hardly ever remember my dreams. I thought about you a lot, I say. Then Benjamin leans in with this very sweet uncertainty and lightly kisses me. And I kiss him back and feel a rush of blood to my head at us kissing so casually, so comfortably, so familiarly. Life is amazing. Our lips come apart and that's when I get the ooze squish blob of falling blood, impending flood. How the frick did my Ultra Plus tampon fill up so quick? Benjamin takes my hand and we start to walk, our arms swinging, bumping lightly, but I am walking funny. I cannot let my pants and tights meet because once they do, the blood will find a path. Then I will be done for. That's fluid dynamics. The period woman who came in year six said, it's only blood, just an egg cup full, nothing to be embarrassed about. But when did she last try to pull with an egg cup full of blood in her pants? You're limping, says Benjamin. You okay? I pulled my thigh, I say, with instant blush. The first word that came to mind, obviously. We take one step. His arm slides under mine. Here, you can lean on me. My heart goes squish. Then with one wrong step, my pants and tights meet. And I walk beside Benjamin, our bodies touching, knowing I now have wet and sticky thighs. So that was an extract from Blood Moon by me, Lucy Cuthie. Seaweed, the estuary at the height of summer. Mad 
magnificent Bordeaux welcomes you, a faded billboard read. An image of Bordeaux showed him to be a middle-aged white man in an old-fashioned black suit. Chains glinted at his waist, trussing him up like he was a criminal or a monster. It wasn't Bordeaux that held Ava's attention, then. Just behind him, hidden in the background, was another man. Younger, with black face paint smeared across his eyes and a wicked grin, Ava shuddered. What a dump, Jolie said. Ava pulled her gaze away from the billboard. Jolie and Clem were looking up at a circular building perched on the highest point of the island. A ground floor video game arcade topped with a nightclub. It had survived the fire intact and looked as tacky as it had the day the island was abandoned 40 years ago. To the right of the arcade were the viewing decks and fairground rides, including a gigantic wooden roller coaster that had been almost completely destroyed by the fire. To the left, steps led between stone buildings down to the lower half of the island. Ava could just see the tents and shacks of the carnival at the bottom, arranged along the island's craggy shoreline, half swallowed by the sea. I was imagining something more... Ava tried to think of the right word. Romantic, she went for, although it didn't quite fit. For the dogging, Clem said, smirking. Her mouth dried up. All she could think about was how they'd kissed, and it wasn't a good memory. Jolie threw an arm around Ava's neck. Ava is going to document the moment when I work out who brought us here and punch their dick off. You have such a lovely way with words, Clem said. I'll write you some lyrics if you want. Thanks, he said, but my tracks don't have vocals. Would it detract from those major seven chords? Jolie said, biting her lip. Clem's gaze flicked back to Ava. She inwardly died a tiny bit. To avoid all the awkwardness, she crossed a wide open square leading up towards the arcade and club. She wasn't there to obsess over the boys. She was supposed to be finding out who was trying to blackmail her. She stopped at a signpost in the centre of the square. All but one of the arrows were broken off. The sole remaining arrow, which just said whispers, pointed around to the left of the arcade, to the steps that led to the shoreline carnival. Ava went over to peer down the cliff face staircase. She could see the outlines of old fabric tents, the material hanging in rain-shredded strips. Forty years of time had eroded the rocky shore and partially flooded the carnival. Water lapped at the bases of old fairground shacks. Something moved. At first, Ava thought that it was the wind blowing through the tents, and then it emerged into view. It was a figure made from shadows, human but also not. Its limbs were oddly articulated, as if every joint had been broken. His eyes were an absence of anything. With awful, jerky movements, it passed through the empty space between tents, staggering across the mirrored surface of the water. And then it was gone. Ava breathed out with a shudder. Did you, did you see that? She stammered. You saw someone? Joey cracked her knuckles and marched over. No, maybe. Now the figure was gone, Ava was no longer convinced it hadn't been a figment of her imagination. Or, fleeting thought whispered, maybe that thing had been her reflection. All the tar-like guilt filling her heart brought to life as the monster Ava was inside. She shoved the thought back down. I thought I saw something, she said, down there, but I don't think it... Right, time to get some answers. Joey headed for the steps without waiting for Ava to finish. What happened to this being the opening of basically every horror film ever? Ava called after her. This is the real one, Joey said. The bad girls always win. Hello, I'm going to read to you from the prologue of The Deathless Girls. Aftermath. There is a time here called aftermath. After the settled have pulled their harvests from the ground and long bound and placed it in dark stores, shored against rats by cats starved in narrow houses where they fight and mate and sleep until they are loosed. After the turning seasons light the trees red gold in the cold, the ground hardening underfoot, wrinkling with frost. 
after the snow comes like a heavy, smothering blanket, pillowing the mountains and setting off the soft fury of avalanches, finding the cracks in rocks and splitting them easy as the seas that are deeply furrowed in stilled earth. After the melt and pivot of another year, after all this, comes the aftermath. The first green moments of a new harvest, the emergence of the slow work happening beneath the thawing soil. For the settled, it is a heralding of the work to come, always the same, sure as seasons. For us, it is a time to move on. The aftermath had just started that year when the soldiers came through the narrow mountain pass, up through the coppery trees and onto this land we lived upon but laid no claim to. It was a beginning into which they arrived, bringing with them the end. Hello, my name's Holly Brace and I wrote Midnight's Twins and I'm going to read you an extract from near the start of the book. As I reach the station and pass through the ticket barriers, my phone vibrates with a message inside my bag. I bet it's Dad with another one of his attempts at a motivational joke. I'll be thinking of you tonight. It's from neither Ollie nor Dad. I raise my eyebrows as I reply to the unknown sender. Wrong number. Tonight's Halloween, and it sounds as though someone's got big plans. Good luck to them. Mine involved changing into pyjamas as soon as humanly possible and cramming for a history test. On the tube, I studiously avoid the curious, pitying glances of my fellow commuters and stare at the front cover of Metro. The headline reads, Ratings Soar for Sebastian Medrout. The photo doesn't do justice to the politician, or at least not his eyes. I've seen him in person outside school. His deep violet irises, somewhere between amethyst and sapphire, made a cyclist crash into a lamppost thanks to an ill-timed double-take. He has always laughingly denied their lenses, and I've always believed him. I know all too well that eyes do indeed come in all colours. I can only read a snippet of the article. In recent years, Medrout has made a staggering comeback to once again capture the hearts and minds of a nation. A typical puff piece, then. The person whose paper I've been reading catches my eye and rustles the pages irritably. I resist the urge to point out that newspapers can, shock horror, be read by more than once, and slide my drawing pad out of my bag. When I come up for air at Sloan Square, I reach into my bag to check, it, check the time on my phone. The unknown number has messaged again. Have you never wondered about your mother's death, Vern? I stop dead in the middle of the pavement, and a man glares as he pushes past. Who is this? I reply, shock making my fingers clumsy. But they don't respond. They haven't replied by the time I reach Bosco College, or by the time I'm forced to put my phone away at the start of double biology. They haven't replied by first break, when I am interrupted in my toilet haven by Lottie Medrout and her harem, or by the time break ends and I slip into the back of the Latin classroom. Why would I wonder about Mum's death? It was simple, she passed away in her sleep. Sudden death syndrome. Rare, tragic, but it happens to all sorts of people. There has never been anything to question. It is only when I am standing in the lunch queue that my phone vibrates again. My whole body flushes as I spot the words on the screen. Your mother knew me by another name but you may call me Archimago. Then, soon afterwards, she and I were knights together in Anun. Archimago, Anun, I may as well still be in Latin for all the sense these words make. I have had time to order my thoughts now, though, and I know what I want to say. I won't be distracted by a strange vocabulary. What did you mean about my mum's death? This time, the reply comes almost immediately. Una didn't die peacefully at all. She was murdered. It's as though the mysterious Archimago has reached through the phone screen, through my ribcage, and is squeezing my heart tight, tight, tight. I place a hand over my mouth to stop myself from showing too much emotion. No one else in the queue seems to have noticed my reaction, though. Half of them are glued to their phone screens, too. I look from face to face, wondering whether this is a malicious prank by one of my peers. How do you know? I reply. And after a moment, I deliberately put my phone back into my bag. If Archimago is watching, I don't want to give them the satisfaction of seeing how shaken I am. I stare straight forward, my elbow pressed against my bag to feel the vibration should another message arrive. I choose the chicken curry and chocolate sponge and take my lunch to my usual table where everyone knows not to bother me. Those words, she was murdered, ricochet around my skull until they break apart. She was murdered. Was she murdered? Murdered she was. I can't help it. I place my phone next to my plate. Elsewhere in the hall... Lottie Medrout's ringing laugh carries over the other voices. 
Spoonful of curry halfway to my mouth, the screen lights up once more. Archimago has replied. I draw the phone towards me and rice spills in maggoty drips into my lap. Because I killed her. Hope you enjoyed that extract from Midnight's Twins. Thanks very much for having me.